Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar uh, that NCAI is hosting on behalf of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, today, uh, FDA staff will be discussing two proposed rules on the implementation of the Food Safety and Modernization Act. Um, we'll have uh, time for Q&A at the end of every presentation. We'll have two slideshows to present to you today on the proposed rules. And uh, if you wish to ask a question at any time during the presentation, uh, feel free to type it in the questions box, and we'll get those all queued up for uh, the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, additionally, uh, at the end of the presentation, if you would like for uh, myself to un unmute your line, your phone line, or your microphone on your computer, uh, you can also use the raise the hand option. Uh, so I'd like to thank you on behalf of the National Congress of American Indians. My name is Brian Howard. I'm a legislative associate. And I would like to go ahead and turn it over to our FDA presenters today. OK, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Joy Johansson. I'm on the produce staff here at FDA uh, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And I'm going to speak uh, and do an overview of the proposed produce rule which was published earlier this year under the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. And I'd like to thank NCAI for hosting this webinar. We greatly appreciate it. So the proposed rule on produce safety is an important step that helps lay the foundation for a prevention-based food safety system for domestic and imported food. Uh, next slide, please. And the proposed rule would create a new Part 112 in Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Next slide. So the rules <clears throat> regulatory framework considers many factors associated with produce farming, such as the diversity of produce farming uh, practices, the broad range of crops, uh, the fact that some on-farm routes of contamination occur in relatively controlled environments, such as fully or partially enclosed buildings, while others occur in an outdoor environment. And we are proposing an integrated approach to this rule that draws on our past experiences with other commodities, such as the good manufacturing practices, the shell egg regulation, and juice and seafood HACCP. Next slide, please. So in terms of coverage, the proposed rule would cover farms that grow, harvest, pack or hold most produce in their raw or natural state. These produce commodities are referred to as raw agricultural commodities. And the proposed rule would also cover the farm portion of so-called mixed type facilities. And these are farms that are also engaged in activities that are outside of FDA's definition of farm. And these activities require the food facility to register with FDA under the bioterrorism regulations. So an example of this would be an establishment that grows and harvests produce, but also conducts activities such as processing fresh cut produce that requires the establishment to be registered. So in such cases, only the establishment's farm activities would be subject to the proposed produce rule. And other activities may be subject to the preventive control proposed rule. And the proposed produce rule would cover both domestic and imported produce. And it would cover farms with an average annual value of food sold during the previous three-year period of more than $25,000. Farms below the monetary threshold would not be covered by the proposed rule. Next slide. And in terms of which produce items are covered, uh, produce is defined in this regulation as fruits and vegetables. And it would include mushrooms, sprouts, herbs, and tree nuts. Uh, produce does not include grains. And some limitations on covered produce are proposed, which I'll go over in more detail. Uh, so the proposed rule includes a number of limitations on coverage. So the following are not covered. Um, produce that is produced by an individual for personal consumption or produced for consumption on the farm or another farm under the same ownership. And I need to, 
take a technical break for a second. Sorry about that. Um, our computer just went into sleep mode. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the following types of produce would not be covered. Produce that is produced by an individual for personal consumption or produced for consumption on the farm or another farm under the same ownership. Um, in addition, produce would not be covered that is not a raw agricultural commodity. So an example of that would be fresh cut bag salad. In addition, um, produce that is rarely consumed raw and identified in the rule as such would not be covered. So a few examples are artichokes, beets, Brussels sprouts, cranberries, eggplant, okra, peanuts, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Additional commodities are listed in the rule. Uh, in addition, produce that will receive commercial processing that adequately reduces the presence of microorganisms of public health significance uh, would be not covered by the rule provided that certain documentation is kept. And an example of this would be green beans sent for canning. And as mentioned, farms with sales of $25,000 or less per year are not covered because they represent less than 1% of all produce and commerce. And the rule also contains a qualified exemption for farms with sales of less than $500,000 per year using a three-year average uh, when the farm sales to qualified end users make up the majority of their sales. And this exemption can be withdrawn in certain circumstances. And there's more detail on this um, exemption in the proposed rule. So, uh, the proposed rule would cover all produce commodities except those that FDA deems would pose little or no risk of foodborne illness. And we took an integrated approach to writing this rule in that uh, we apply the most stringent requirements to agricultural practices that pose the greatest likelihood of contamination of the produce. So a benefit of selecting this integrated approach is that we would cover all commodities um, except those that pose little or no risk of foodborne illness, but we would still take into account the sporadic and unpredictable nature of foodborne illness outbreaks and still be sensitive to risk. Next slide. Uh, as indicated, the proposed rule focuses on five identified routes of microbial contamination of produce. They are agricultural water, biological soil amendments of animal origin, worker health and hygiene, equipment, tools, buildings, and sanitation, and domesticated and wild animals. And in addition, there's specific requirements related to fresh sprouts and additional requirements um, related to growing, harvesting, packing, and holding. Next slide. So I will now go through the identified routes of microbial contamination in more detail. I'll be summarizing some of the proposed requirements, but will not cover every one. So I encourage you to consult the fact sheets on these routes of contamination that you can find at fda.gov slash FSMA um, for Food Safety Modernization Act. In addition, of course, the proposed rule has the most detail on all these issues. So the first route is agricultural water. Um, water used for produce production presents different microbial quality demands depending on its use. Water can be a carrier of many different microorganisms of public health concern. The proposed rule defines agricultural water as water used in covered activities on covered produce where water is intended to or is likely to cover con covered produce, contact covered produce or food contact surfaces. So this would include water used in growing, such as irrigation water directly applied to produce and water used for preparing crop protection sprays. 
It would also include water used in harvesting, packing and holding activities, including water used for washing or cooling harvested produce, and water used for preventing dehydration of covered produce. So all of the water that is defined as agricultural water under the rule would be required to be safe and of adequate sanitary quality for its intended use. And at the beginning of the growing season, the agricultural water system under a farm's control would have to be inspected to identify conditions that are reasonably likely to introduce pathogens to produce or to food contact surfaces. And the water system would need to be maintained to prevent it from becoming a source of contamination of covered produce. So next slide, please. So I'll go into a little bit more de detail on agricultural water requirements. The proposed rule would establish specific requirements for the quality of agricultural water that is used for certain specific, specified purposes. So this includes provisions requiring periodic analytical testing of such water, with exemptions provided for use of public water supplies under certain specified conditions and exemptions for treated water. And the rule would require certain actions to be taken when such water does not meet the quality standard. And we propose standards for water that vary depending upon the risk posed by the use of the water. So um, when agricultural water is used for growing activities for covered produce using a direct water application method, farms would be required to test the quality of water using an appropriate analytical method. So if there were more than 235 colony forming units found per, of generic E. coli per 100 milliliters of water for a single sample, then the farm would be required to immediately discontinue use of that source of agricultural water for these uses and take specified follow-up actions. So this is a provision where the proposed rule would permit alternatives um, in terms of the water testing provided that they provide the same level of public health protection. And I'll talk more about alternative approaches later in the presentation. So the other, there's a second agricultural water standard in the proposed rule. So farms must test agricultural water to ensure that there's no detectable generic E. coli in 100 milliliters of water when the water is used for certain purposes, such as if it directly contacts covered produce during or after harvest. So this, this is not an irrigation water standard. This is during or after harvest, um, including water used to make ice. And the standard will also apply when water is used to contact food contact surfaces and also for hand washing during or after harvest activities. Next slide, please. So the proposed rule would establish requirements related to frequency of testing of agricultural water that are subject to the testing requirements that were mentioned in the previous slide. Um, it's important to note that there is no, there would be no requirement to test water when the farm receives water from a public water system that furnishes water that meets the microbial requirements under those regulations, or when the farm treats the agricultural water in accordance with the proposed rules requirements for water treatment. The most frequent testing requirements pertain to untreated surface water, such as lakes and rivers. So untreated surface water used for purposes subject to testing requirements and from a source where the underground aquifer water is transferred to surface water containment, constructed and maintained in a manner that minimizes runoff damage into the containment, such as a man-made reservoir, will be required to test at least once each month during the growing season. And then untreated surface water um, that is from a source where a significant quantity of runoff is likely to drain into the source such as a river or natural lake, would be required to test at least every seven days during the growing season. So that's the most stringent testing frequency. For other sources of agricultural water, the proposed rule would require testing any agricultural water subject to testing requirements 
at the beginning of each growing season and every three months thereafter during the growing season. Next slide. So this is the last slide on agricultural water. When a farm has determined or has reason to believe that its agricultural water is not safe and of adequate sanitary quality for its intended use, the farm would be required to discontinue use of that source of water and its distribution system until the farm either reinspects the entire agricultural water system under its control, identifies any conditions that are reasonably likely to introduce known or reasonably foreseeable hazards into or onto covered produce or food contact surfaces, make necessary changes, and test the water to determine if its changes were effective. Another option would be for the farm to treat the water in accordance with requirements in the proposal. So, next slide. So, the next um, subpart in the proposed rule and source of potential microbial contamination of produce is biological soil amendments of animal origin. So, Soil amendments as an umbrella category are any chemical, biological, or physical material intentionally added to the soil to improve the chemical or physical condition of the soil in relation to plant growth or to improve the capacity of the soil to hold water. And the proposed rule would define biological soil amendments of animal origin. And um, if, if everyone could put their phone on mute, please, because we're hearing some background. Thank you. Our biological soil amendments, which consist in whole or in part of materials of animal origin, such as manure or non-fecal animal byproducts, or table waste. <coughs> so this term, as defined in the proposed rule, would not include any form of human waste. Uh, the proposed rule focuses on these biological soil amendments of animal origin because of the potential for these types of amendments to contain uh, pathogens which can contaminate produce with um, microorganisms of public health concern. So physical and chemical soil amendments would not be covered by the proposed rule because we don't see risks associated with those type of amendments. Next slide, please. So the underlying framework for the provisions in the rule related to biological soil amendments of animal origin is that stricter control should be required for an application practice that is more likely to result in the amendment contacting covered produce than for one that is less likely to result in contact. So the standards in the rule for use of these amendments vary depending on whether the amendment is untreated or treated and if it's treated, how it's treated. Um, they also vary depending on the time interval between the application of the biological soil amendment of animal origin and harvest of covered produce, and also whether or not the covered produce contacts the soil after application of the soil amendment. So, uh, next slide, please. So, the proposed rule would establish requirements for treatment um, when these amendments are treated that use scientifically valid controlled physical and or chemical processes. And the rule would also allow for composting processes and specifies microbial standards uh, for the composting processes. So the proposed microbial standards that are in the rule for soil amendments are not intended as lot by lot microbial testing requirements. Instead, uh, the, the grower would need to apply the treatment process that's indicated in the rule to monitor the physical parameters of the composting process. For example, the temperature of a compost pile to ensure that the compost meets the conditions under which the process was validated. And this is another area of the rule, um, composting, where, where we're proposing to allow alternative approaches that meet the same level of public health protection. So, next slide, please. So this table 
illustrates a menu of options available under the proposed rule for use of biological soil elements of animal origin. So the interval between the application of a biological soil amendment of animal origin and the harvest of the covered produce would vary depending on whether the amendment is treated or untreated. So you can see, for example, in the last row of the table, um, the type of treatment is the quote unquote mushroom substrate standards, which are very stringent microbial standards. So in, if a firm chose to use this approach, then they would have no restriction on whether the crop contacts the amendment and they would have no application interval between harvest and growing. You can see the zero days in the application column. Whereas um, another example of kind of the opposite end of the spectrum would be in the first row. If there was a um, untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin, such as raw manure, <laughs> and there would be a nine-month application interval between when the amendment was applied and when the produce could be harvested. And there, would, there could be no contact um, at application of that amendment between the soil and the crop. And then it would need to be minimized afterward. So there's a menu of options available to growers. And we request comment on all of these provision, proposed provisions and options in the proposed rule. Um, next slide, please. So the next uh, potential route of contamination is worker health and hygiene. Um, pathogens may be transmitted from people to food, in particular through the fecal oral route. And requirements in this part of the rule include uh, personnel who handle covered produce or supervise such personnel must receive training in specified topics. And the rule also includes measures to prevent contamination of covered produce from any person with a communicable illness, infection, open lesion, vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, in addition, personnel who work in operations in which covered produce is at risk of contamination must use certain hygienic practices to the extent necessary to protect against such contamination. So these would include maintaining adequate personal cleanliness, avoiding contact with animals other than working animals, and minimizing contact with um, covered produce when in direct contact with working animals, washing hands thoroughly before or after certain activities and at other times, and maintaining gloves appropriately if gloves are used. But I would note that the proposed rule does not require glove use. And in addition, the rule includes measures to ensure that visitors are aware of policies and procedures to protect covered produce from contamination. And toilet and hand washing facilities would be required to be accessible to visitors. Um, next slide. So the next part is um, equipment, tools, buildings, and sanitation. Um, the rule seeks to ensure that equipment, tools, and buildings are clean and of adequate design and construction to be adequately cleaned and properly maintained and to thereby minimize contamination of produce. So specific requirements include that equipment and tools must be of adequate design, construction, and workmanship to enable them to be adequately cleaned and properly maintained. Uh, food contact surfaces of equipment and tools must be inspected, maintained, cleaned, and sanitized as frequently as reasonably necessary to protect against contamination. Buildings must be suitable in size, construction, and design to facilitate maintenance and sanitary operations to reduce potential for contamination. Also, uh, buildings must be constructed in such a manner that floors, walls, ceilings, and pipes can be adequately cleaned and kept in good repair, and that drip or condensate does not contaminate covered produce uh, or food contact surfaces. 
into this and um, buildings would need to uh, not pose risk of contamination from domesticated animals and pests and buildings would be required to have adequate, readily accessible toilet and hand washing facilities. Next slide. So the next um, potential microbial source of contamination would be domesticated and wild animals, which are one possible route of contamination since pathogens can be introduced into fruit and vegetable production systems by animal feces. And on this topic, the proposed rule balances the need to prevent contamination with the need to be practical and flexible with the diversity of produce operations and to ensure that prevention measures are in harmony with resource and wildlife conservation efforts whenever possible. So these requirements in this section would only apply when there's a reasonable probability that animals will contam contaminate covered produce. So for example, when covered produce grows completely underground, we would expect that there would not be a reasonable probability of contamination by domesticated or wild animals that may graze on the field. So in this section, requirements include that if animals are allowed to graze or are used as working animals in fields where produce is grown, and there is a reasonable probability that they might contaminate cover produce, the grower would be required to wait an adequate amount of time between grazing and harvesting any growing area to ensure the safety of the harvested crop. And if working animals are used in a growing area where a crop has been planted, implement, the grower would be required to implement measures to prevent the introduction of hazards onto covered produce. <clears throat> so for example, if a grower used draft horses um, as working animals, they might, under this provision, establish and use horse paths that are segregated from the produce. And in addition, the um, growers would be required to monitor for animal intrusion, and if it's observed, evaluate whether the produce um, should be harvested, and it would prohibit the harvesting of visibly contaminated produce, such as produce that has um, bird excreta or animal excreta on the produce item. So, next. <coughs> okay, this is um, the last set of uh, provisions in the rule in, in terms of preventing microbial contamination. This is kind of a catch-all section on additional growing, harvesting, packing, and holding activities. So requirement in this subpart includes that for operations handling both produce that's covered by the rule and produce that would not be, um, if the excluded produce is uh, not handled in accordance with the rule, the firm would be required to separate the two types of produce and clean and sanitize as necessary food contact surfaces that are used on the produce not covered by the rule before using those surfaces on produce that is covered by the rule. And additionally, the uh, farms would be required to not distribute produce that drops to the ground before harvest unless it is exempt uh, from the rule because it receives commercial processing that would adequately reduce the presence of pathogens on the produce. And in addition, um, food packing materials would be required to be adequate for their intended use, such as cleanable or designed for single use. And um, if food packing materials are reused, the firm would be required to take measures to ensure that food contact surfaces on those materials are clean. Next slide. <laughs> so one way the proposed rule is flexible is that it permits alternatives to certain requirements. So, and I've mentioned this somewhat already, but the proposed rule would provide that farms may establish alternatives to certain requirements related to water and biological soil amendments of animal origin if the alternatives 
been scientifically established. Um, please put your phones on mute. We're getting some fast background noise. If the alternative is scientifically established to provide the same amount of protection as the requirement in the proposed rule. And um, as a side note, FDA would not be requiring farms to submit their alternative approaches to FDA for approval or to have on record. It would just be something where uh, the, the farm would be required to keep documentation of the validation of that approach. And if we were to come to your farm, um, such as during an outbreak event, uh, you would need to be able to demonstrate the sufficiency and validity of that approach. Next slide. So the proposed rule also is flexible in that it would allow a U.S. state or a foreign country to request a variance from some or all provisions of the proposed rule. And the state or country would need to determine that this variance is necessary in light of local growing conditions. And um, practices under the proposed variance would need to provide the same level of public health protection as the requirements of the proposed rule. <coughs> and the proposed rule provides a process by which FDA would consider such requests and approve or deny them. So this is a formal um, approval process. Next slide. And the proposed produce rule would require certain records, for example, records um, that document that certain standards are being met. And one example of this is water testing records. However, the rule would not require duplication of records that are already being kept for other purposes by the grower. Uh, next slide. So compliance dates for the produce safety rule are staggered based on size of the firm. And FDA is proposing that 60 days after the final rule um, would be the effective date of the rule, but farms would not need to meet the requirements by that date. So FDA is proposing staggered compliance dates for farms, um, very small farms that have an average annual value of food sold of more than $25,000, but no more than $250,000 per year, would have four years after the effective date to comply. And for some of the water requirements, these firms would have six years to comply. Next slide. And small farms that have an average annual value of food sold of more than $250,000 and no more than $500,000 a year would have three years after the effective date to comply. And for some of the water requirements, they would have five years to comply. Other farms that do not meet the definition um, described here of very small or small would have two years after the effective date to comply. And for some of the water requirements, they would have four years to comply. Next one. So we encourage and welcome comments on the proposed rule from a wide variety of stakeholders, um, including all of you on the phone. The proposed and final rules and supporting documents will be filed in FDA's official docket at regulations.gov and also can be accessed at fda.gov slash FISMA. The comment period has been extended for a second time, and it now extends to November 15, 2013. And we have coordinated the comment period on the major uh, proposed rules as fully as possible to enable public comment on how these rules can best work together to create an integrated and effective food safety system. So the other rules that we also have proposed for comment are the preventive controls uh, rule, which my colleague, Dr. Mickey Parrish, is going to discuss in a moment, and the foreign supplier verification program rule and the third party audit certification rule. Uh, next slide. 
So just as a reminder, the rulemaking process takes some time. Um, FDA must follow several steps. Uh, first, we propose a rule that's published in the Federal Register so that the public can review it and submit comments. And for the proposed rule, um, pub the public typically has 120 days to comment, although in this case, the comment period has been extended. FDA considers comments received during the comment period and then considers revising the rule based on our review of the comments before we issue a final rule. And then in the preamble to the final rule, we plan to discuss the significant comments that we've received. So, and then the last step is FDA issues a final rule and sets dates for companies to comply. So, next slide. And um, my colleague, Annette McCarthy, is going to discuss um, this next set of slides. Good afternoon. Um, the National Environmental Policy Act requires that agencies consider the environmental impacts of any final action that they take. For the proposed rule, FDA issued a claim of categorical exclusion from the need to prepare an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. Um, next slide. We did, however, put questions into the preamble to the proposed rule to see if the underlying assumptions that we used for that categorical exclusion did apply in all situations. Some examples of these questions were to what extent have farmers taken action to exclude wildlife from outdoor produce growing areas, and what measures are being used for these purposes. Uh, there are also questions that address water quality and um, the soil amendments. Next slide. We've also asked whether implementations of measures to prevent animal intrusion negatively impacted habitat for rare declining aquatic or terrestrial wildlife species or migratory birds. Specifically, we were looking for issues related to um, the taking of endangered or threatened species. Next slide. The basis for the categorical exclusion identified three key areas in the five primary provisions that have the potential to have environmental impact. Each of these are discussed in the categorical exclusion memo. They were agricultural water, biological soil amendments, and domesticated and wild animals. Um, ultimately, for the proposed rule, we determined that no significant impacts were likely based on best available information. However, through the public meetings as well as comments to the record and ongoing review, we have since changed our decision. Next slide. Whoops. Can we go back to? Sorry, we seem to have skipped. Thank you. Um, specifically, of those five provisions, we now have concerns that there will be significant environmental impact with two in particular. Um, the first would be agricultural water. Our assumption for the categorical exclusion was that based on the standard length of an E. coli outbreak that would exceed the E. coli standard established for the rule, that it was unlikely that we would see any significant changes in the behavior in terms of water sources or treatment. However, it has come to our attention that particularly in the Pacific Northwest, that farming practices are such that it is highly likely that we would see a change from uh, surface water to groundwater uh, sources. And there are concerns, of course, already with uh, the sustainability of groundwater. So anything that results in further drawdown is a concern. The second issue for us is the biological soil amendments. Uh, we were relying on local state uh, regulations to really control how much um, runoff and other issues we would see with, with the uh, changes in soil amendments. 
we are now coming to realize that those regulations are not as extensive as we had originally believed. Um, so we do have questions as to whether or not the proposed rule could change farming practices in such a way as to result in a significant change in the use of soil amendments that could ultimately result in a change in uh, nutrient runoff and nutrient enrichment in our water bodies. Next slide. Okay, sorry, we skipped another one. Um, the one issue that we have not yet determined um, or contradicted in, from our categorical exclusion is domestic and wild animals. Um, we continue to seek input on this issue. Thank you. Um, and are continuing our review in this area. However, FDA was very clear in its preamble that the intent of this rule is in no way to force farmers to take an endangered or threatened species, that the ultimate goal is really concern about avoiding harvesting of a specific plant if you have contamination. It is not aimed at larger scale methods, um, but we do continue to see comments. Next slide. Um, as with the uh, rule process in general, this is a very complex process and there are quite a few steps. Uh, we are at the very beginning of it. Um, FDA published its notice of intent to prepare the EIS on August 19th, and we are actively seeking comment from stakeholders as early as possible. Um, that when we published the notice of intent, we also opened the public scoping period in the same document. That scoping period is open through November 15th um, to coincide with the rule in general. And we welcome any feedback that the tribes have to offer. Um, once we complete the scoping period, we will prepare a draft environmental impact statement. That EIS will also be released for public comment, giving everyone a second chance to um, pro provide input on the document. Next slide. Uh, we will consider any substantive comments that we receive and consider whether to revise the EIS. And of course, those comments will be taken into concern, uh, consideration also for the proposed rule. Um, the final EIS and record of decision will be issued at the same time as the final rule. We do not expect that the preparation of the EIS will substantively delay the implementation of the rule. Thank you. I think we're now turning, Joy, please clarify if we're accepting questions or if we're turning this over to the next rule. Uh, Misty, Paris, and I were just chatting. I think it might be best to go straight to the preventive control rule and then do questions at the end on all the presentations, if that works for NCAI. Yeah, um, we can go ahead and do that right now. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. This is Mickey Parrish. I'm Senior Advisor in the Office of Food Safety at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with information on the proposed preventive controls rule. Um, next slide, please. The proposed rule establishes a new part in Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations, that being Part 117. This addresses the prevention of food contamination <laughs> and is a slight uh, change in our current regulatory activities. Next slide, please. In summary of the requirements, the new draft rule establishes requirements that are related to the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls that are very similar in concept and outcomes to HACCP or Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point programs that are currently required for seafood and juice, and I might mention also required for meats, 
under the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. The new draft also revises good manufacturing practices that currently exist in Part 110 of Title 21. Upon finalization, the GMPs will be covered, uh, the revised GMPs will be covered in Part 117. Next slide, please. In terms of the good manufacturing practices, um, FDA is, has updated, proposed updates to the good manufacturing practices in Part 110. Some of the things that which have been addressed include protection against allergen cross-contact. We've also updated language such that, for example, instead of seeing the word um, shall, such as a firm shall take X action, that we now use the verb must, a firm must take action. Certain provisions that contain recommendations, for example, a firm should do something, uh, will be deleted from good manufacturing practices. Other comments, uh, and we are requesting comments on whether training should be mandated, and whether other parts of good manufacturing practices that are recommendations, in other words, a firm should do something, uh, should be um, uh, actually required re rather than recommend recommended. Next slide, please. There are some other features of the rule that should be addressed. Um, for example, definitions in 21 CFR Part 1 will clarify activities that are included in the definition of the term facility. And this gets back in part to what Joy covered in her talk. Um, activities that are included in the term facility would um, Put, could potentially put a firm under the preventive controls rule regulation. This clarification will constitute uh, on-farm manufacturing, processing, packing, and holding of food. The, uh, another feature of the rule is that we are proposing definitions for a small and very small business. Next slide, please. <coughs> In terms of who is covered, any facility or firm that manufactures, processes, tax, or holds human food is covered under the rule, with some exceptions. In general, any facility that's required to register with FDA under Section 415 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, will be covered by the rule. Uh, registration with FDA has been required since the 2002 uh, Bioterrorism Act. The um, Act will, or the rule, will apply to both domestic and imported food, and that we will have some exemptions and modifications that I'll discuss a little later. Next slide, please. To comply with the rule, a company that manufactures, processes, packs, or holds foods must have a written food safety plan. This plan will have sections that are very similar to the seven steps of HACCP. As with HACCP, the first step is to conduct a hazard analysis. That is, determine which hazards are reasonably likely to occur. This is followed by the establishment of preventive controls that are needed to control those hazards. And preventive controls then need to be monitored, and a plan for corrective actions to address deviations that may be found during monitoring must, must be established as part of the plan. Processors must engage in verification activities to ensure that the plan is effective in controlling hazards and must maintain appropriate records and documentation. Next slide, please. There are a number of exemptions and modified requirements for the rule. 
One of those exemptions is for qualified facilities. In other words, a facility that qualifies for an exemption will be either a very small business, and there are three definitions being proposed for a very small business. Those three definitions are a business that has total annual food sales of less than $250,000 or less than $500,000 or less than $1 million. Or a qualified facility could be a firm that has food sales that average less than half a million dollars per year during the last three years and in which uh, at least 50% of those sales are to a qualified or to qualified end users. Qualified end users would include um, restaurants and other retail outlets. Next slide, please. Another exemption that has been established within the proposed rule are for foods that are currently subject to the low acid canned food regulations, and that would be for the microbiological hazards only. So if, if your firm produces food that's covered under 21 CFR Part 113, you would be exempted from the rule. Other exemptions include foods that are subject currently to uh, HACCP by regulation. So seafood, which is covered under 21 CFR Part 123, and juices covered under 21 CFR Part 120 are exempted. Additionally, dietary supplements and alcoholic beverages are exempted from the rule. Next slide. Um, another exemption is for facilities such as warehouses that only store packaged foods. And the, these are foods that are packed in sealed containers, either retail or in bulk, uh, foods that are not exposed to the environment. The only exception for this exemption is for facilities uh, which handle or store uh, packaged foods that require temperature control. So if the food requires refrigeration or freezing under specific conditions, then that facility will be required to uh, have documents showing that uh, appropriate temperature controls are uh, being handled uh, appropriately. Next slide, please. Another exemption is related to facilities such as grain elevators that store only raw agricultural commodities like um, soybeans, corn, or wheat. And that's intended for further distribution and processing. This does not include facilities that store fruits and vegetables. Uh, the facilities such as grain elevators are also exempt with respect to current good manufacturing practices, uh, another part of the rule, and uh, that is the current situation. Uh, grain elevators currently are already exempt to CGMPs. Next slide, please. As I pointed out, Facilities and warehouses that store raw agricultural commodities that are fruits and vegetables are not exempt from the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls part of the proposed rule. However, they are exempt, as they currently are, from, with respect to CGMPs. Next slide, please. <coughs> There are farm-related exemptions, uh, and as Joy pointed out, there's sort of differences based on the activities that occur on a farm as to whether or not um, those activities are considered farm or facility. So activities within the definition of farm, including farm activities in the proposed produce rule, are exempted from the preventive controls rule. Also, certain low-risk manufacturing, processing, packing, and holding activities that are conducted by small and very small businesses 
on farms for very specific foods are exempt. For example, production of jams and jellies. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the farm definition, um, the activity really, it, it depends on which activity is conducted. And I would encourage you to take a look at Section 8 of the preamble to the Preventive Controls Rule, <clears throat> excuse me, which provides information related to on-farm activities. And it clarifies activities that are included as part of the term facility. And again, if you are a facility, you are covered by the Preventive Controls Rule. Also, tables 1 through 5 in the preamble summarize how activities are classified, rather, whether on-farm or facility. Next slide, please. So when would the preventive controls provisions apply to the produce industry? These would apply to any firm that manufactures or processes produce items such as bagged salad. So if you cut, slice, chop, <laughs> shred um, produce items and put them in uh, packages, then you are, would be um, covered under the preventive controls rule. They do apply to any packing houses that are off the farm. If you have a packing house that is part of your firm, but the packing house is located geographically off of the farm, it will be covered under the preventive controls rule. Um, whether the PC rule applies to on-farm depends on whether activities outside the farm definition are being conducted. And as Joy pointed out in her pre presentation, we're talking about a mixed type facility. So for example, if you have a packing house on the farm and you pack produce that you produce only on your farm, then the PC rule does not apply. But if you pack produce from other farms, then the PC rule would apply. Next slide, please. So activities that are outside the farm definition would include packing and holding food that is not grown, raised, or consumed on your farm, as I just mentioned, or another farm that's under the same ownership, and manufacturing, processing food that's not consumed on that farm. So if you, uh, choose, if you process food, but you consume all of that you process on farm, then the PC rule does not apply to you. However, if you manufacture or process food and then sell it, um, the PC rule would apply to you. Next slide, please. So activities of mixed type facilities that are subject to the PC requirement would include things like cutting, coring, chopping, or slicing of produce, freezing produce, drying that creates a distinct commodity like drying grapes to make raisins, or artificial ripening. These are all activities that would subject the facility to the preventive controls requirements. Next slide, please. So as Joy pointed out, the effective and compliance dates uh, are essentially the same. The, the effective date will be 60 days after the final rule is published. Compliance for small businesses, and we define small businesses as one employing fewer than 500 persons, would be two years after publication of the final rule. For very small businesses, and again, as a reminder, we are asking comments on what a definition of very small business should be, whether it should be one that uh, has less than uh, or $250,000 in annual sales or $500,000 in annual sales or a million in, in annual sales. So for very small businesses, they will have three years after publication to comply. And all other businesses, which are essentially the large businesses uh, uh, that would have more than 500 employees, would have one year after publication of the final rule. And this is a little different than the produce rule in terms of timing. 
Next slide, please. So next I'd like to discuss some of the specific provisions that are in the hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, as part of this preventive controls rule, a firm will need to conduct a hazard analysis to identify known or reasonably foreseeable hazards that are reasonably likely to occur. This must consider hazards that may occur naturally or may be unintentionally introduced and must include biological, chemical, physical, and radiological hazards. I will point out that hazards that are intentionally uh, added to foods for the most part will be covered under a separate rule that has yet to be um, published for intentional contamination. However, two questions that we have proposed for comments are, should FDA include potential hazards that may be intentionally introduced for economic reasons? Um, uh, uh, that, that question has been proposed for comment, as well as uh, when can an economically motivated adulterant be considered reasonably likely to occur? Now, in terms of hazard evaluation, we are asking that the facility determine whether hazard is reasonably likely to occur, including an assessment of the severity of illness or injury if the hazard were to occur. They must include an evaluation of whether the environmental pathogens are reasonably likely to occur. And when we say environmental pathogens, we're talking about pathogens that may exist within a food processing facility in areas where ready-to-eat food is exposed to the environment prior to being packaged. In considering the hazard evaluation, you would uh, think about things such as formulation of the food, facility and equipments that are used, raw materials and ingredients, the transportation practices, manufacturing procedures, intended use of the food, and sanitation, including employee hygiene. Next slide, please. Required preventive controls that are uh, mentioned in the rule include process controls, that is controlling the process that's used uh, during food manufacturing, food allergen controls to protect against cross-contact with food allergens and to ensure that labeling is um, uh, proper related to allergens, and sanitation controls, that is, cleanliness of food contact surfaces and prevention of cross-contact and cross-contamination, and a recall plan. Now, within the recall plan, um, there Written procedures are, we are asking that you include written procedures that describe steps how, of how you would directly notify your direct consignees of the food that's being recalled, how you would notify the public when appropriate to protect public health, how you would conduct effectiveness checks to verify that the recall is being carried out properly, and appropriate disposal of the recalled food. Next slide, please. Some additional preventive controls that we are seeking comments on uh, include uh, supplier approval and verification programs. Can, these can help ensure that raw materials and ingredient suppliers have appropriate programs to address food safety and that they are complying with practices that adequately control hazards in the production of those supplies. Two questions that we would ask are, should FDA require supplier approval and verification? And when and how is supplier approval and verification uh, an appropriate preventive control measure? Next slide, please. Another part of the food safety plan is monitoring facility must have written procedures including frequency of how monitoring will be conducted and how often it will be conducted. 
Monitoring must be documented in records that are then subject to verification. Next slide, please. As mentioned, if you determine during monitoring that a deviation has occurred, you should have a written corrective action plan. The facility must establish and implement this procedures to identify and correct the problem with implementation of a preventive control, ensure the, the affected food is evaluated for safety, and ensure that any adulterated food is prevented from entering into commerce. Next slide, please. Another point in the food safety plan is verification. We require that any validations that are conducted, such as validation of a process to ensure that the process will eliminate a pathogen, that that be validated. Um, other verification activities include calibration of equipment and review of records. Next slide, please. The food safety plan must be reanalyzed at least every three years. Also, it should be reanalyzed any time there is a significant change that creates the potential for a new hazard or increases the potential for a hazard that was previously identified. Uh, Reanalysis should be conducted when there is new information about potential hazards or when a preventive control is found to be ineffective. Next slide, please. We are also seeking comments on additional verification activities that may be included in the final rule. These would be things like review of consumer complaints. Should a facility's review of complaints be required as a verification that its preventive controls are effective? Finished product testing. Should FDA require finished product testing? If so, when and how is finished product testing appropriate? Environmental testing. Should FDA require environmental testing to be included in the final rule? When and how would environmental monitoring be appropriate to verify that hazards are being controlled? And if environmental testing is required, what is the appropriate level of specificity? Next slide, please. The preventive controls rule requires that each firm have on staff a qualified individual. This qualified individual must have successfully completed training related to the development and application of risk-based preventive controls. And this training should be at least equivalent to the, the, that that would be received under a standardized curriculum recognized as adequate by FDA. And I'll point out that we currently do have a Preventive Controls Alliance that includes um, members of academia as well as industry and government representatives who are working on standardized curriculum for this training activity. So an qualified individual should be, have uh, training that would be equivalent to that curriculum. Or a qualified individual may be qualified through job experience to develop and apply a food safety system. Next slide, please. Responsibilities of this qualified individual is to prepare a food safety plan, um, validate preventive controls, review records, and reanalyze the food safety plan as needed. Next slide, please. The required records that this individual would have to review include the written food safety plan, the records that document monitoring of preventive controls, records that document the corrective actions that are taken for deviations, records that document verification activities, and records that document training for the qualified individual. Next slide, please. And the next couple of slides are essentially uh, equivalent to what uh, Joy has already uh, covered. And again, we're pointing out simply that this is a long process. And we are currently at the point of simply having a proposed rule. And we are requesting comment. 
Uh, once we have the comments, we'll consider them in revising the rule and we'll ultimately issue a final rule and set the compliance date at that time. Next slide, please. To comment on this rule or the produce rule or any of the other, the other two rules that are currently open, uh, you may go to regulations.gov or go to www.fda.gov slash FSMA. Comments are due by November 15th. And we're trying to, we set that date so that we can try to coordinate um, uh, the comment periods for the four rules that currently are in draft form. Next slide, please. So if you have any additional questions, I would encourage you to go to the FISMA website, that is fda.gov slash FSMA. And um, there's lots of information at that website regarding our current activities for FISMA. So with that, I will turn it back over to Joy. Oh, OK. OK. Thank you. And uh, I think at this point, we're ready to take questions. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the presentations. Uh, again, this is Brian Howard with SAAI. Uh, if you have a question, please use either the question box by typing in your question there, and we can queue those up to ask the FDA staff. Uh, additionally, if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to uh, ask a question either over your phone or through your microphone on your computer, um, you can also use the raise the hand option. Uh, keep in mind if you are using uh, your computer uh, speakers to listen to the presentation, uh, we'd highly suggest either a headphone or um, headphones with a microphone or some sort of headset. That way we don't get any feedback on the system. And um, if people are go ahead, or typing their questions right now, I'll go ahead and ask um, a couple of uh, questions uh, raised during the last presentation that were submitted through the chat box. Um, one concern was raised by an attendee about uh, regarding training, would there be any uh, formal training offered by FDA in regards to this uh, proposed rule? Um, yeah, I'm not sure which. Uh, in terms of both proposed rules, for the produce safety rule as well as the preventive controls rule, there will be training. Uh, the produce safety staff also has uh, an alliance um, that's working on curriculum for the produce rule. And training will be offered uh, probably through the local land grant universities and the extension service uh, because we have a lot of extension agents who are working on the development of these uh, of the two curricula. And a training activity is going to be similar, I suspect, to how Juice Hassett was handled, where um, uh, training opportunities are provided through local universities and um, they will fulfill the requirements for training uh, that are, exist in the rules. All right, thank you. Uh, we also had another question in regards to um, if the proposed rule is replacing the gap process. Oh, thanks. That's a good question. So the uh, GAPS refers to the Good Agricultural Practices Guidance Document that FDA uh, developed in the late 90s, and that guidance still stands. However, the proposed post rule would be requirements, whereas the, the GAP guide is recommendations. All right, thank you. Uh, we also had another question uh, from an attendee. Uh, when does the FDA plan to provide consultation opportunities with tribal governments? concerning the issues related to both rules, uh, specifically asking whether consultation will occur between tribal governments beyond the NEPA-related issues. Hi, is Mary on? OK, um, I'm just, the question was in regards to consultation with the tribe. Right. Hi, this is Scarlett Salem. I'm also part of the produce safety staff at FDA. And um, we have been extensively consulting with Mary Hitch, who is the FDA um, Tribal Affairs contact. She's located in the Office of External Affairs. And so we've been consulting with her and also our Department Tribal Affairs contact, Stacey Acoffey. Um, this is the second informational webinar 
that's been given, that's been sponsored by NCAI, and we are working towards pulling together a consultative webinar with FDA senior leadership prior to the close of the open docket. Um, we are um, exploring other mechanisms that will allow us to consult with the tribes, and we look forward to sharing that information in the future as details further develop. So short term, we are working towards a consultative webinar. And if there are any further questions about tribal consultation and outreach, we would encourage um, uh, people on the line to contact Mary Hitch, who's located in the Office of External Affairs again. All right, thank you. And in terms of when that consultation will be announced, do you have a general time frame? At this time, we don't. Um, again, um, there has been a lot of discussion around it, so I don't have anything to provide at this point other than prior to the close of the open docket. But again, as soon as we receive those details, we'll definitely share those. All right, and then we also have another um, question from an attendee. If the training is expected to be conducted by local and grant university extension staff, then will there be funding available for that effort? That's a good question, and we can look into that and get back to you. I think the details of the trainings are still being worked out. All right, thank you. Um, so we also have another question. Uh, how do these rules apply to those travel communities who are extensively engaged in produce marketing and production, but who are off public water supply systems? Uh, so just for clarification on the question, this would be tribal uh, growers and packers of produce? I believe so. Okay, so they would follow the uh, subpart of the rule with respect to agricultural water, which uh, sets out requirements related to uh, uses of water other than through the public water system. So there's, there's detailed requirements, and uh, I recommend reviewing those and commenting on them if you have any, any comments. All right, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in over the questions box. Uh, again, if you'd like to ask a question over your phone or through your microphone, you can also use the raise the hand option, and I can unmute your line. So I'll give people uh, a couple of minutes just to um, uh, finish up any anything that they're typing or, or anything like that. Additionally, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will post it online. Uh, and also share the uh, slide decks that the presenters used today. Uh, we will also share uh, Mary Hitch's contact information, who is, as mentioned earlier, the tribal liaison for the Food and Drug Administration. So I'll just um, wait a minute for people to finish up in case they're typing something right now. And we have a question from an attendee. Uh, are there specific water testing requirements for aquaphonics or uh, aquaculture? Uh, that is an area that the proposed rule does not specifically speak to, but it is an area that we've received a lot of questions on in the comment period, and I expect that we will be addressing it in the final rule, so I recommend that if anyone has uh, recommendations on what those requirements should look like or might look like, uh, that you submit them to the docket, and uh, we'd be very interested in your feedback. All right, thank you. And we'll just wait uh, another minute in case anyone else is typing a question. <clears throat> 
All right, seeing no other questions, uh, as I had mentioned before, uh, we will be uh, sending out the PowerPoint to the email addresses that had registered on this webinar, and please feel free to share those as you, as you uh, feel as needed. Um, we'll also be sending out a link for uh, where the recording of this webinar can be found online, and additionally, uh, the contact information for the presenters and Mary Hitch. Um, Joy, I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything else before we end the session. I uh, just wanted to reiterate our thanks to NCAI for hosting this webinar, and uh, thanks to everyone who called in. All right, thank you. That concludes today's session. I wanted to thank everyone for uh, attending. And again, we will send uh, all of the information out in, by uh, COB today. So expect that within one to two hours after the session is ended. Thank you again, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon.